Hello, this is Dr. Jack Wolfson, board certified cardiologist, and welcome back to the Healthy Heart Show. And today I've got my good friend on the show, Dr. Roby Mitchell, also known as Dr. Fit, and he is just a badass doctor uh, <laughs> down in Texas doing some amazing stuff. Dr. Fit, how are you? I'm doing great. Glad to be on the show. Uh, Dr. Fit and I go go way back, and I say way back, it's probably about three years or so, uh, but I feel like he is truly a, a brother from another mother because we, uh, we, we, we just we just talk the same language. We both came from you know the medical background and saw the light. Uh, uh, Roby, tell me tell me some of your story as far as you know what, what made you uh, uh, want to become a, a physician in the first place. Well, I was in the Marines and I had gone in to be a Harrier flyer, right to fly Harriers, and so got in. They found out that I didn't have twenty twenty vision, so they wouldn't let me fly, right? <clears throat> and so. Uh, I became a martial arts instructor, and just after a while, you know, thought maybe there was something more that I had to offer to society, and so sat down, you know, pen and paper, and I wrote down all the characteristics that I wanted employment to offer, and two things fit, checked all the boxes, that was either being an attorney or a physician, and my dad was an x-ray tech, right, so I had been, um, I had been exposed to the hospital environment, so I decided to get out, you know, and, and go to medical school. Fantastic, fantastic, and the world is better off certainly for you being a a medical doctor than uh, than another attorney. Uh, although I know if I needed an attorney and I wanted someone on my side, it would definitely be you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dug in either way. So, so uh, you become a, an emergency room doctor. Yeah. So in the Interim, though, you know, when I went to medical school that first year, the the head of the physiology department took a real liking to me, and um, I guess just noted I had an aptitude for for science, you know, and physiology, and asked me if I wanted to take a year out and get the PhD in addition, right, to the to the MD, you know, and I said sure. And so while I was under his tutelage, he had set up a an ex student exchange program between Texas Tech University Medical School and Jinan University Medical School over in mainland China. So he sent me over there to study uh, acupuncture and Chinese traditional medicine. So I was over there for four months and really got to see firsthand that this stuff was not, you know, mind over matter, you know, placebo stuff. These people were actually getting great results with this idea that the human body was able to heal itself. So I finished up over there, though, and came back and became an emergency room doctor. And like everybody, you know, you get busy and the drug companies are bringing all that free food, you know. And so I got fat, developed high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. And uh, I was 35, and a 37-year-old came in with a heart attack, right, when, uh, when I was there as an ER doc. That kind of got my attention, so I said, I thought I'd better get these numbers under control. So I started taking, uh, asked one of the cardiologists, you know, at the, at the lunch table, you know, what, what do you take for high blood pressure? He put me on a, told me to uh, get a, um, a beta blocker. And unbeknownst to me, I had undiagnosed hypothyroidism. And that plus a beta blocker, bad news, right? Gave me all these side effects. So that turned the light back on, right? And got me going back to guidance tech, textbook of physiology and understanding, right, human physiology and what, what causes high blood pressure in the first place? What, why does cholesterol go up? Uh, I didn't have any of these problems when I was in the Marines. Why at 35 do I have all these imbalances, right? And that's what I found out that they were imbalances, not diseases. And I thought that maybe the double meat, double cheese water burgers might have something to do with it. So I quit those and the fries and the chocolate shakes. Started eating better, and what do you know? You know, no more high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or diabetes, which we had been taught all those were incurable. Well, why is it that most medical doctors, and once again, now you're, you're an MD, you're an emergency room physician, why do most medical doctors not understand that there is a cause to what's happening? Why would other emergency room doctors just take the drug? Why wouldn't they just take the blood pressure drug, the cholesterol drug, take the aspirin, your diabetes drug, and go on your way? Why, why aren't they doing it, and why did you make that change? You know, there is a, uh, a book <laughs> called True Believers that goes through the psychology of cult thinking. And they have a list in there of the just kind of the common denominators that cults use in order to get, you know, really smart people to, um, to, to believe in some mythology. 
And when you go through that list, it's the exact same list, you know, that, that's used in medical school. So one of them, you know, is putting somebody up in front of you, you know, that kind of seems like a deity and has a special garb, right, that they wear, you know, like the white coat and the stethoscope. Another thing was uh, using an esoteric language, right? Of course, that first year, first two years, that's what we spend learning, right, is an esoteric learning. Uh, there is the promise, you know, of this big reward, right, at the end of your, <laughs> your journey, right, which for us, you know, is money and a Maserati or whatever. Uh, separation from family and friends, right? And then the, um, you know, some kind of, ex creating some kind of extreme conditions, you know, like we go through in residency. Those are all the recipes that it takes and that can create, and uh, again, regardless of how intelligent a person is, it can indoctrinate you into a type of, of thinking that is uh, adjacent to reality. You know, and I get, I get, it's quite obvious how, how that would happen to a medical doctor. Like you said, you just spelled it out, you know, for, for the MDs. Uh, and I think that also goes for pharmaceutical sales reps as well. What you just said, how those reps, you know, must be obviously they're educated on a totally new language and they're done so by someone up on stage that is wearing a medical coat or maybe uh, it's a salesperson saying, hey, I do drive a, you know, Porsche or a BMW and this could be yours. At, at the end of the golden rainbow over here, you know, when you learn all this stuff as well. So I think that that true believers, that's, that's really, it's, it's scary, frankly, because it's exactly what happened, you know, to us. And even those, and even the pharmaceutical reps would be at their own meetings, uh, you know, amongst their peers, you know, for a week at a time. And like you said, isolation, that's absolutely fantastic. But I mean, how lucky for you that you had the, the opportunity when you were a medical student to go over and train in China. How amazing was that? That was fantastic, you know, and that really was the, the foundation. I, I, I wonder many times, you know, if I hadn't had that exposure, right, would, would I have made the, the same choice, right? Because that, I, I, again, over that for four months, I got to see visually hand-on people get well without drugs, right? And so I had that paradigm to fall back on. I don't know if I hadn't had that paradigm, you know, what if I would have just switched to another drug. <laughs> Yeah, you know, obviously we've all had those those moments, and of course, as I interview all different people, and I know you know so many medical doctors and so many people in the health space, you know, we all have that aha moment when we made that switch, and yeah, the world is definitely a better place for you or for all of us because you know because someone like you made that made that switch, and you've been such a great friend to Heather and I. And on our side, on, on all these different issues that we're trying to tackle, and and the cr you know cross promotion of the stuff that 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 you're doing, um, I know that you are a big proponent, and we'll talk. We're going to talk about drfit.com and and uh, d r f i t t, and we'll put that in the show notes as well. dot com, where uh, Dr. Fit has some amazing products that he has formulated. There, are, a lot of them are very unique, and they get the job done, which is the most important thing. But I know that there's a couple things you are very passionate about, a few, well, many things you are, but um, maybe, maybe tell us about our mutual friend, Jonathan Wright and stomach acid. Yeah, so <clears throat> Jonathan Wright is literally wrote the book on nutritional medicine. It's called Nutritional Healing. Uh, wrote this book, I think back in the 70s. He's a Harvard trained or Yale, I think he went to Yale, trained physician and uh, figured out Again, what I figured out later, that the body is this uh, biochemistry mechanical machine, right, that has some parts that it needs, and if we put those parts back, then it has what's called autonomous homeostasis, right? And so I went to a lecture by him on uh, nutritional medicine, and you know, once I had kind of started sticking my toe in the water of this, you know, I thought, man, there has to be other people that came up with this long before I, I did. And fortunately, the internet had come out then. I was able to look up a couple of doctors that were doing nutritional medicine. And it was Dr. Hugh Reardon there in Wichita, Kansas, and then Dr. Jonathan Wright. So I went and studied with both of them. <clears throat> but I heard Dr. Wright give a lecture. And uh, after the lecture, I just I went up and you know, just talked to him, told him I was just starting to study this. He gave me a whole set of his tapes, right? I mean, these tapes that he was selling, you know, for a couple hundred dollars, he just gave me a whole set of them. And man, I thought that that was so impressive for me. So I went back, you know, and listened to those and, you know, really got into this more and more and more and studied more and more and then went and studied wh with whoever else I could study with him, Christine Northrup, um, uh, Doris Rapp, a lot of these uh, people that have been um, 
superstars in nutritional medicine and uh, kind of came into my own as uh, a person doing nutritional medicine, so much so that he invited me out to, um, to um, be an associate director of his clinic there in, in, uh, in, in uh, Renton, Washington. And that's when I really learned uh, from him this very critical piece of human physiology, that's the production, stomach production of hydrochloric acid. When every time that we eat, you know, our stomach produces enough hydrochloric acid to create a pH in the stomach, a hydrogen ion concentration, three million times the arterial pH, right? And it doesn't damage the stomach lining. That's amazing in and of itself. But that's important for two reasons. One is that it does a scorched earth kill of bacteria, viruses, and fungi. So even though you don't see it on that food or whatever you, that you're putting in your mouth, it's covered with bacteria, you know, all kinds of critters. Well, in order for us to prevent them from getting into the bloodstream, that hydrochloric acid is produced and totally sterilizes the stomach with that wash. <clears throat> the other thing is that those nutrients that you have to absorb, they have to be ionized in order to absorb, right? They have to have an electrical charge. That's the other thing that that super concentrated amount of hydrogen ions does is it ionizes your B12 and your magnesium and potassium and amino acids and so forth so, so they, they can be absorbed. One of the reasons that I developed high blood pressure is because of inadequate production of hydrochloric acid. Magnesium levels get low, potassium levels get low. That's what I did my PhD in actually, right, was the um, uh, blood pressure physiology. And I had done these experiments with a manometer, you know, with uh, uh, rat tail arteries in different solutions of different ions, so calcium, uh, magnesium, potassium. And intellectually, I knew that magnesium and potassium were vasodilators. I knew that calcium was a vasoconstrictor. I knew that nitric oxide was a vasodilator, right? But again, now we get stupid with that indoctrination and all that stuff just went out the window and I, and I took a pill. But once I, uh, again, relearned and restarted studying what I now call intelligent design, which basically means, right, that, that we have an intelligent design to this body. And if you stick with that, right, it goes back to this, what we call uh, autonomous uh, homeostasis. Absolutely tremendous. And, and, you know, Jonathan Wright, when I first met uh, Heather, Dr. Heather, she said to me, she, you know, she you know, gave me some books and stuff like that. And she gave me this book called Why Stomach Acid is Good for You by right. Jonathan Wright. And I just, it was such an aha moment. Like, I don't even have to read the book at this point. Why Stomach Acid is Good for You. Why didn't I think of that? Oh, wait a second. I did learn that for four years in medical school. And then somehow, right, they got to us and they said that stomach acid and heartburn and of course, at the time, it was things like Tagamet and Zantac, which are HP right. blockers. And then yep. they come out with the big guns, which are the proton pump inhibitors, the Prilosex, and so on and so forth. And so, so Dr. Fit, what you're telling me is stomach acid is good for you. And along those same lines, right? Tell me all the different problems associated with the stomach acid blockers. Yeah, so because of that integral uh, piece that hydrochloric acid does again. So if it's not there, then you don't absorb certain nutrients. If it's not there, then you can have overgrowth of you know fungi, viruses, um, uh, uh, and, and bacteria. So so many of these uh, conditions that we call autoimmune conditions, right? Those are a result of not producing adequate hydrochloric acid, and then particularly, you know, candida growing up out of the gut where it normally is in everybody, if you're not producing adequate hydrochloric acid, then it can start to travel. And depending on your genetics, so, you know, candida is a, uh, a saprophyte or a, uh, a scavenger like vultures, right? And scavengers, they attack tissue that is dying or dead. And so, each of us, because of our genetics, we have some places in our body, you know, that are not as well uh, irrigated as some others. And so they tend to you know, get weakened first. And that's where the candida will go. If it goes into your joints, right, then the immune system responds to that with the production of these cytokines and you get rheumatoid arthritis. If it gets into the lungs, the immune system responds to that with inflammation and somebody gets asthma. It can be acne, it can be rosacea or eczema or irritable bowel syndrome or celiac disease or, or a number of other different things. But they are all 
a consequence of these um, uh, microbes overgrowing and then the immune system responding to that. That's not something they, they taught about, we didn't learn about in medical school is how powerful the immune system is, right? I mean, I, I realize that as an emergency room uh, physician treating anaphylactic shock, but people don't understand that viruses don't cause disease. It's the immune system response to the viruses, right, that actually causes the disease. This problem that we're having now with acute flaccid myelitis, right, it's just polio. It's the same exact disease as polio. But that happens because this enterovirus, D68 enterovirus, has been added to the polio virus. Children that are not producing enough hydrochloric acid, that virus will multiply, travel to the spinal cord, and then the immune system response will damage the myelin sheet, and we get the polio-like <laughs> disease called acute flaccid myelitis. But it's just polio by another name. Uh, and well said, and, and, and you know, and so, you know, what you know, polio was, was that, you know, poliomyelitis means, you know, gray, uh, gray matter inflammation. So it's right. a matter of what's causing all that inflammation in there. Like you said, whether it is an actual, uh, you know, the polio uh, virus or it's an enterovirus or uh, anything that can cause, you know, any kind of external uh, chemical, you know, DDT, pesticides, uh, uh, you name it can certainly do it. But uh, you're right. It's all, the, you know, the body's response. And when the body starts to attack the nerve tissue from any kind of insult, you'll, you can have uh, paralysis. Um, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, fungus, why, why is it so difficult, I guess, to test for the fungus uh, conventionally? All the typical tests that we do, even if you do a stool analysis, maybe occasionally when I do it on people, it shows up as, as a low amount of, of candida. But uh, the fact that in, in the majority of cases, I mean, you've, you know, we've read all these different books and, and William Crook and all these, you know, kind of the originators of the fungal hypotheses, uh, yet how do we test for it? Yeah, so, and that has been a holy grail for some time. And when I got into this, you know, we started, uh, you know, started the stool testing, right? We tried testing for blood. Uh, they started trying to test for the, um, the mycotoxins, right, being left behind. But nothing really gives a good test. And the reason is because the, these infections, the fungal overgrowth is very localized, right? So like you can see a piece of mold, say on an, on an apple, right? On the backside of an apple, right? Everything else, it, it looks fine. And so any place else that you test on that apple is going to come out good, right? Except for that one place. And so we don't have tests that or that specific, right, to go into the blood, to go into the liver and so forth in order to, to test. So we do have um, though these symptom charts that we can go by that are pretty accurate as far as telling whether someone has a candida overgrowth. Okay, very good. So, and, and so, but, you know, circling back, you know, once again, it's really this stomach acid type of thing. Um, tell me some, uh, and stomach acid is so important. Obviously, that's why we have it and why the stomach is so acidic, as you talk about. It's the beginning, really, of, you know, discounting the mouth uh, and its digestive uh, enzymes up there, getting into the stomach and really starting off that digestive cascade. What are some hacks and some strategies to improve stomach acid production? And then tell me about uh, the best supplement. So understand that that energy that's required to produce hydrochloric acid, that comes from thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone, it is the spark plug in this equation of fuel, oxygen, spark plug, right? So you got to have something to ignite things. And thyroid hormone does that for us. So as thyroid levels go down, energy production goes down, and you're not able to produce as much hydrochloric acid. Now, that can happen just with age, and none of us is getting any younger, right, unfortunately. So as we get older and those levels of hydrochloric acid are, are down, then we can supplement with a hydrochloric acid. So I've developed one called Robenzyme that puts uh, the hydrochloric acid plus these B vitamins plus the pancreatic enzymes back. And when we do that and address the, the uh, thyroid deficiency and teach people how to eat where they don't have this very high glycemic uh, index diet, right, all that sugar in their blood, then we can get rid of the critters and then the immune system stops with all the production of the cytokines. Now, stomach acid, of course, is, is HCl, hydrochloric acid. Uh, hydrogen you can get from basically everywhere. You know, when you, when you drink water, of course, there's hydrogen in the water. When you eat food, that's all loaded with hydrogen. What about the chloride? How do people get that uh, chloride if we're going to talk it from a dietary standpoint? Is that just adding a little bit of uh, sea salt to their diet? Are we salt, yes. Yeah, sea salt, very important. Um, and 
you know, for other reasons also, right, that your immune system uses that uh, hypochlorous ion as a defense mechanism. That's one of his weapons of mass destruction. Right, so that's another reason you know it's important for us to get that uh, the chlorine from the sea salt into our diet. Also, the energy production. So you know your car battery, the way that it produces energy is by ions flowing back and cross against a permeable membrane. Our membranes and our, our our cell membranes, same thing. All these you know the chloride, magnesium, uh, potassium, those flowing back and forth across that permeable membrane creates energy for us also. So that's another reason you know. Uh, all these minerals right in the aggregate are important fantastic and of course you know when you have when you have a good amount of hydrochloric acid in the stomach stomach acid to break down the food to tiny little uh, things that are easily absorbed uh, I think also you know when it comes to everyone's familiar with the concept of leaky gut and leaky gut is from a variety of things but certainly one of which is undigested food particles right get in there right and irritating that small intestinal villi in the lining because you're not digesting your food and then of course you don't digest you don't absorb all the nutrients and you can't heat the body can't heal itself right right one of the things that piqued my interest when I went out to work with dr. Wright you know he, he's uh, he has an environmental allergy clinic, you know, and they treat children with allergies. And we started doing this ALCAT test, right, with test children, treat people for allergies. And I saw these children, I mean, have, you know, 10, 15 different allergies to food. And over and over again, I saw that. And that, we just didn't see that when I was a kid. We didn't see you know, kids with all these different food allergies. So I wondered, right, whether it's because this is a digestion problem, right, not a, um, you know, a genetic allergy problem. So we started giving them the, uh, the hydrochloric acid, you know, with each meal, and what do you know? They come back, do the allergy, no more allergies. So what happens if even two amino acids are stuck together and they get into the bloodstream, your immune system sees that as a foreign protein and reacts. That's what allergies are. They're not true allergies, they're poor digestion. All right, so how do people, how do people get more information about how to use – uh, your supplementation, take Robenzyme, take any kind of hydrochloric acid supplement, any kind of betaine, HCL molecule. Um, how, uh, now, obviously, we're going to tell, we'll, we'll preempt everybody. You and I are both, uh, we're both uh, uh, doctors here. Check with your consulting doctor, your practicing physician before you take our advice. But tell me an example of a protocol you would use with someone for acid replacement. So first, I them check their blood work, right? So if you're not a, if you're not producing adequate hydrochloric acid, you're not absorbing adequate B12. If you're not absorbing adequate B12, your red blood cells will start to get gradually larger and larger and larger. And the number that we look at for the size of red blood cells on your blood work is called MCV. If that that MCV, it has to be a, a your red blood cells has to be a, a small window of size in order for it to function properly transporting hemoglobin and oxygen. It can't be too too small, it can't be too big, right? So if that, uh, around 85 is what you want it. If it starts getting much over above that, that's telling you that you're not getting enough B12 because you're not producing enough hydrochloric acid. Certainly 90 or above, then that says you're not producing adequate hydrochloric acid. So once we uh, determine that, and you know we go through this litany of, of symptoms, people not producing uh, adequate hydrochloric acid, uh, they will you know have a full feeling in their stomach, they will have gas, they will have bloat, they will have reflux, they will have uh, yeah, gastrointestinal reflux, heartburn, uh, children will develop acne, uh, the uh, babies will develop eczema, uh, cradle cap, um, um, the um, uh, diaper rash, right, those type of things, recurrent ear, nose, throat infections, all that is from not producing adequate hydrochloric acid. And so once we determine that, then we just start adding hydrochloric acid to each meal. People, um, people will titrate their own dose. Adults, say, start with five, go to six, seven, eight. To some point, they have heartburn, and then they back down one from that. Uh, the children babies, even babies out of the womb, you know, will start on one per meal. Of course, you have to open up the capsule, right, and put in some liquid or whatever, but they can take one per meal if they've got eczema, psoriasis, you know, uh, those type of things. Older kids, right, then graduate to two, three, again, depending on their age, and works really well. And so just in within a week's time, you know, the skin rash is gone, the um, uh, asthma, all these things that, um, what we call childhood diseases. You remember, you remember the, uh, um, uh, the, they grew out of it, <laughs> thing, you know, with childhood diseases. 
they grew out of it because it got taller. <laughs> yeah, no, right. what happens is they mature, that stomach matures, and they start producing hydrochloric acid, right? Not all children do, but once you start producing that hydrochloric acid, right, then those childhood diseases go away. Uh, absolutely. Priceless, priceless information. Is there anybody that um, we should worry about with using acid supplementation, uh, people with a history of peptic ulcer, gastric ulcer disease, or you know, we ask people the questions, are you currently bleeding? Uh, let me ask you this, is, is a history of a stomach ulcer, is that a contraindication to use of stomach supplements, acid supplements? Yes, so those people you want to put first on a two-week program to heal the gut lining, right? Uh, and there are several supplements out there. We have one called Firefighters, but it has the you know glutamine and the aloe vera, uh, slippery elm, and those things that build the stomach lining back up, right? So you make sure that lining is built back up, and then uh, that normal stomach lining is bulletproof to the hydrochloric acid. But many times, if hydrochloric acid is low and those critters start to grow, you get inflammation, right? Your the immune system will respond with inflammation, trying to keep those critters under control. And as a collateral damage, it will damage the lining of the stomach, right? Cause what we call gastritis. And that can you know, move on into peptic ulcer. <clears throat> so, but that's, it's healable, right? We can heal that portion of the stomach back up, just like you covered a skinned knee, right? With new skin, right? And then it's not sensitive to salt anymore. That stomach lining can heal back up and then you can take the rope inside. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic stuff. Uh, what about H. pylori? Where does that play a role? So H. pylori, candida, E. coli, strep, staph, all of those critters are with us all the time, right? So H. pylori is not an infection, it's an overgrowth caused by inadequate production of hydrochloric acid. So once you put that hydrochloric acid back in there, then H. pylori levels, they go back down. They don't go away, right? They're, it's a normal microbe that is normally part of the fauna of, uh, of humans, like E. coli is, but it goes down to a level where it's not stimulating the immune system response. Okay, so if somebody has uh, H. pylori, that um, by definition means they have an ulcer there, they've got some kind of small ulcer maybe, so in that, in that situation, whether it's a definitive ulcer or it's H. pylori, or somebody with a history of maybe either or, do the two-week protocol to build up that stomach lining and then in, uh, introduce the acid. Yeah, so there's an ingredient also that kills the H. pylori also uh, in, the, in the firefighters. So we get, we get a kill also in addition to healing the lining. Uh, absolutely. You know, do you, uh, this is amazing. I didn't have to come all the way to Texas to come visit you to learn all this stuff. I get to learn. <laughs> and so does everybody around the world. We get to learn from, from the brilliant Dr. Fit. This is just, uh, it, it, you're such a breath, uh, fresh of breath air talking to you. It, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, because this is really just so counterintuitive to what people are hearing and they're going on some nasty antibiotic protocol right. They're going on something that shuts down the stomach acid, which is the exactly. problem in the first place. Right, right. Yeah And so there's a there is a didactic site that I have also is drfitinfo.com. I call it dr. Fit University so there's just and all information like this on that site that people can go and read up on study for themselves and get smart Love it, drfitinfo.com, and Dr. Fit has all those different protocols, and of course, he's got a fantastic line of supplements, and uh, he's got uh, one of his favorites, and one of our favorites, the black cumin seed oil, and uh, you know the black seed oil, the black cumin seed oil. The only thing about the black cumin seed, and especially if you, can get, if you wanna get like the fresh seed, you gotta throw that in the coffee grinder, we throw that in the salad dressings, and you know, we use your black uh, seed oil to put that in the salad dressings as well. Yeah, the black uh, seed oil, I stumbled up on it by accident. I had somebody put up a blog about it, and I started, uh, of course, you know, I've been into what's called pharmacognosy, or you know, the study of plant medicines, you know, for 30 years. And so when I started looking at the black seed oil and looking at the science under the microscope, I mean, it really checked a lot of boxes as far as these ingredients that we know that plants carry that kill bacteria, fungus, viruses, and so forth. And so I got some and sent it off to um, have it tested with a gas chromatography and mass spectroscopy. I mean, you know, I came back with like three pages of uh, ingredients that this um, has, one of which is escaridol, which is an antiparasitic. So the black seed oil, I mean, is really at the top of the list as far as taking things that are going to keep down the level mm -hmm. of your microbes and fight off. Yep. Okay. What... Um 
Um, so, you know, black seed oil goes, you know, it goes, first of all, you can cook with the black seed oil, you can just spoon it in uh, raw, you can put, it, it's a strong, strong taste. So it goes in well with, um, you know, with vegetables, goes in well on the salad dressing, like I said, but uh, it's no hot fudge sundae, that's no. for sure. <laughs> it does have a pretty strong taste. Um, and, and, and that strong taste is from all those chemicals, right, that are medicine. And I tell people, right, the more offensive it is, the more you need it. <laughs> I, I agree. You know something in there is working. You don't know how it's working. But you know, just like you said, the medical literature on, um, uh, what is it, uh, Nigella sativa, Right. Uh, you know, the black seed is is really tremendous. And the Egyptians have been using it for, for you know, thousands and thousands of years. So that goes without saying. Um, give me some words about the importance of, you know, you mentioned the, the critical need for thyroid hormone to provide the energy spark plug to run all the protons across the gradient, you know, to get into the more acidic environment. And that also, it, you know, also happens inside of our cells, in our organelles, our lysosomes, which are the cellular garbage cans that are all acidic, that bring in cellular debris and help to break it down. So it's not even just about stomach proton pump, it's about all the different proton pumps producing acid around the body. Around the body, right? And your, your mitochondria, which is the carburetor, basically the carburetor for the body, that's where cellular respiration takes place. And again, it's this basic energy equation of, of fuel, right? Like you have gasoline, oxygen, and spark plugs in your car. In the mitochondria, you have to have glucose and oxygen and T3, right? Uh, Triiodothyronine uh, to kick off that reaction. And that energy from that reaction, that gives our body that core temperature of 98.6, which is really critical because that temperature up here, right? <clears throat> keeps our body from dropping down into this temperature where critters overgrow. You know, it's like hamburger, hamburger meat, right? You can have hamburger meat in the freezer. It has some bacteria in it, but there's, the number is static. Once you bring it out and put it on the counter and it starts to thaw, then those critters start to multiply. If you eat the hamburger meat here, you get food poisoning, right? So what are you going to do? you got to bring the heat up here and kill them. So you just can't leave it down here in this window Right, like in the bacteria lab, right, we put, if we want to grow microbes, we have to set those incubators at a certain temperature. So you got to keep your temperature up here. And that's one thing that thyroid hormone does. It is allows us to keep this temperature up here. Once it starts gradually going down, then again, depending on your genetics, those critters are going to start growing one place or another. If they start growing on your arterial epithelium, right, then you get plaque. If they start growing uh, in the lungs, uh, again, it's asthma, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Alzheimer's in the brain. Those are all, if you look, you know, look at the uh, root cause, they're all linked to inflammation. And inflammation is just an overactive immune system, and it's doing cholesterol. Why is there such an epidemic of underactive thyroid, and why don't the medical doctors recognize that? Well, you know, it's that, again, it comes to that cult thinking, and what we were taught in medical school is that here's your range, right, <clears throat> of, um, that, that is normal for, for thyroid hormone. And as long as you're in this particular range, then we're going to say that you're normal. Now, you may have started up, up up the thyroid level for Jack uh, Wolfson may have been up here, and then it drops down to here in your 30s, and then down here in your 40s. So it's still just above normal, right? But they call that normal. Think if that was IQ, right? And your IQ started up here at 120, and then you went through medical school and got down to 100, and now it's at 70. Well, 70 is normal, Jack, right? Aren't you happy with that? No, you're not happy with a 70 uh, IQ. So what I found out is that if that TSH is above one, right, TSH is above one, then that, that usually indicates low thyroid. So you got to do the test, but there's also lots of symptoms. If you got cold hands, feet, if you got dry skin, if you got dry heels, right, if you have depression, if you have um, you know, a lot of uh, um, um, flaking in your skin, particularly down at, at the bottom, and uh, dry feet, if you have uh, dry scaly skin on your uh, elbows, right, if you have ridges in your nails, if you have scalloping around your teeth from your tongue swelling and pressing against your teeth, if you have recurrent uh, uh, candida overgrowth, right, all of those are symptoms of not having enough thyroid hormone, cholesterol, right, that uh, the thyroid used to be, or cholesterol used to be the test 
poor man's test for hypothyroidism, right? So thyroid levels go down, you get that candida in the uh, liver and the inflammation, uh, cholesterol goes up. So if your cholesterol is up, then you need to take a look at your, your TSH. Same thing with triglycerides and so forth. But uh, the uh, thyroid is such a lynch, linchpin, uh, again, because any system that requires energy to keep operating, you start taking out energy, then that system starts to fail. So how do we fix that? This is obviously a, a, a uh, uh, very, and it's not a loaded question, but there's a, it's a long answer. Give me, give me a couple of quick strategies to help get your thyroid back on track. Well, one of the things, you know, with that, that causes low thyroid is um, this kind of silent inflammation that can happen in the thyroid. Now, sometimes it'll go full blown and go into Hashimoto's or Graves disease, but many times it's just a silent um, uh, inflammation. And one of the things you can do with that is just put the black seed oil topically on your thyroid gland, right? That'll clean out a lot of you and kind of get things uh, going back then, <clears throat> going back. The other thing is the eating plan, right? The one that you espouse and the one that I espouse that bring down those levels of sugar, well then that brings down the level of candida that also helps rejuvenate the thyroid. And then we also have a a supplement uh, that is a thyroid glandular. So luckily, all mammals produce the same thyroid molecule. So we can mix and, mix and match. So prescription-wise, there's a supplement called a prescription uh, armor thyroid that is thyroid glandulars from pigs. We have a thyroid glandular from clean New Zealand cows that's called uh, OMG spark plug. So people can take that also and improve thyroid function. Absolutely fantastic. I'm, I'm so glad, obviously, you carry the supplements with, with just such the basic things. And, you know, I mean, like you mentioned, as far as the, the uh, you know, like so many people are loading up on all the different B vitamins and they're doing B12 shots and all these different things. Uh, they may not even need it because they're, if they're taking the HCL to be able to break down the food, absorb the nutrients, on and on and on. Fantastic stuff. Are you, uh, you know, what about uh, iodine? Uh, what role does iodine play? And are you one of these guys who recommends high dose uh, iodine? Uh, I think it's like Dr. David Brownstein and these people that recommend monster doses. Where, where are you on this? Yeah, so understand what iodine is. It's a halogen, right? Iodine, chlorine, bromine, fluorine, right? Those are all in the same column in the periodic table, and they're what we call halogens. <clears throat> halogens are very powerful critter killers, right? And so we have a receptor, right? It's that DHA or that fat uh, um, uh, fat receptor on every cell that iodine attaches to. And when it attaches to that, then that allows it to ride shotgun. It's like keeping chlorine in your swimming pool or putting chlorine in the municipal water. All of our cells should be saturated, you know, head to toe with those iodine molecules in order. To, that's one of the ways that we keep um, critters from growing also. You notice fish, right? They're in the ocean. They're basically living in a big toilet, right? How do they stay healthy? They don't get vaccines. They don't come out and go to the doctor and get antibiotics where well, they stay healthy, right? Well, one of the reasons is all that iodine that's in the ocean, it keeps the, all the critters from, from overgrowing. So we can do that ourselves also with, uh, by taking an iodine. And that can be um, nutritional iodine, right? So, you know, people in Japan, they eat lots and lots of seaweed, and that keeps their iodine levels up. Uh, when mankind lived near the ocean, we got plenty of iodine, but now everybody lives inland and we don't. So an iodine supplement is, is a good idea. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so much information in such a short period of time. I think that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this, obviously, you're going to have to listen again and again and again and break out these gems. And you're going to go to uh, drfitinfo.com. You'll get this so much information and obviously drfit.com he's got these magical supplements that he's recommended as well so make sure you check that out for all things health and wellness uh dr fit what's uh what's the latest in, in your world and what do you got planned for uh 2019 and beyond well so we've started another company bally food development corporation and we're gonna i'm gonna make sure we send you some so our first offering or these uh, gluten-free, grain-free tortillas. They're made from mesquite flour, coconut flour, and green banana flour. So they're going to have, you know, lower your glycemic uh, or, or lower your blood sugar and help with cholesterol. And, but the big thing is they taste marvelous. They taste fantastic, right? So we'll, we'll send you some. Love it. Love it. Look forward to it. Uh, expanding into the food and, and listen, obviously the Bali, the Bali cookbook. And um, who, who was the co-author on the cookbook? I forgot her name. Um, uh, 
Dawn? Yeah. <laughs> Dawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, don't tell her you forgot her name. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay. Um, wonderful. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to another fantastic episode with Dr. Fit, Dr. Roby Mitchell. I'm Dr. Jack Wolfson, board certified cardiologist, a paleocardiologist, and this has been another episode of the Healthy Heart Show.